when Japan attacked us at Pearl Harbor, they uh, made a big mistake because it united this country like it's never been united before or since. And we really got together and, and uh, participated. And they call it the greatest generation, but I don't know. I always felt like we're just doing what we have to do. But I have to say that the country did get together and the attitude was, let's go out and do what we got to do and get this thing over with. And so, um, I don't know, it sells good books, but <laughs> I think it just, uh, uh, we were just doing what we had to do. Um, everybody knows where they were on, uh, on uh, December 7th, 1941. I had uh, just gotten out of college that summer and uh, got a job at the uh, Sacramento Air Depot, later McClellan Air Force Base. And even later, it's shut down and it's McClellan Air Park now. Uh, I was a junior aircraft mechanic and we were b busy with B-17s, uh, switching over the fuel tanks to self-sealing tanks. And we we're creating up P-40s, sending them to the Far East. And uh, December 7th came, it was a Sunday. We were working 24 seven. I had just gotten back on days. They put all the young guys on the, the midnight shift, the graveyard shift. And I had just gotten back on days and it was Sunday, I don't remember what time, but it was uh, later in the day because of the time change. But the uh, uh, foreman came around, he says, hey, you, 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 Bud Anderson, go home and come back at midnight. The Japs just attack us at Pearl Harbor. My God, I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. But it was uh, uh, very clear to me that, hey, we're going to be at a war before this is, uh, gets, gets going much further. And let me tell you how I uh, learned how to fly. Always, it was, a, it was a passion with me as a little kid. And uh, I was one of these guys that had models hanging over the wall and, and uh, pictures all over the, my room. Uh, and I have to truly say it was a passion. I just, I just wanted to do this so bad. I wanted to fly. So I went to uh, figure out what to do. I knew mom and, dad, mom and dad didn't have enough money to teach me how to fly. So I looked up the requirements to um, uh, join one of the services. And I found out that the, under the peacetime thing, you had to have, uh, you had to have, uh, you had to be 20 years old. You had to have two years of college, physically fit and unmarried. So I went after, uh, uh, high school here in Auburn, where I live right now. <laughs> um, I found a, a, a junior college in Sacramento. And my, my mother worked in the, uh, the Capitol there in the governor's office. And she drove back and forth to work. So it was very convenient for me to help her with the driving and then I had a car to go on out to a school and let them back. And so I took an aeronautics course 
that qualified me to be an aircraft mechanic. But while I was there, this great thing happened. The government had this program of um, uh, the civilian pilot training program. Without obligations, a young man could get a private pilot's license uh, with, it, with no obligations to the government. And so for $2.95 for an insurance policy for my parents, uh, I got a private pilot's license while I was in my second year of uh, junior college. I flew in the basic, most basic airplane there was, the Piper Cub. And only this, this was an early Cub. And it was an advertised 45 horsepower Cub. It was not fast. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, it was easy. It was a, the uh, junior college was the classes I was taking on the second year were out at the uh, Sacramento Municipal Airport, now called Executive, uh, Executive Airport. And uh, so it was very, very convenient, very easy. And I don't remember a lot of, uh, of uh, super good remarks, but I don't remember a lot of bad remarks. And so I, it, it, it became easy for me to fly and I felt comfortable and uh, got those uh, got those marks off uh, on my second year of college. I didn't fly much uh, from then on out to uh, while I was working on the depot. And so in, in, when, the, when, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, I was still 19. And I had to wait one month until I turned 20. And I went right to the recruiting station on the uh, on the uh, on the on the depot, uh, the Sacramento Air Depot. And a few days later, I went on my birthday. I went to sign up. And a few days later, I raised my right hand, and I was off on my way. So I'm thinking join the service and see the world or, you know, or see the United States. And so where do you think I went to go for my primary training? San Diego, California, about 400 miles from here. <laughs> I had never been out of the state. I don't think, well, I'd been over into Nevada, but uh, basically I'd never been off the farm. And uh, so uh, we went down there, signed in. It was a Ryan School of Aeronautics. It was not even the U.S. Army or the Army Air Corps. Uh, and what was happening was that we didn't have enough instructors world, uh, statewide to cover the Army's needs. So they hired civilians and uh, flying schools and things like that to uh, train the young men. Uh, there, back up. There was uh, uh, um, Ryan School of Aeronautics there. Um, uh, headquarters and hangars and airplanes were all kept at Lindbergh Field, San Diego. And what we did as cadets, uh, you teamed up with an instructor and he flew you out of uh, Lindbergh Field, I suppose for insurance purposes, I don't know. And then we flew uh, out into the Mesa up where uh, uh, 
I forget the name of the field is there today, but it's up there where uh, Miramar was in that vicinity. And uh, there was an old bombing range out there, a couple of them. And we had a little dirt strip and a little shack. And we, the first ones would go up there, get their, first, get their lesson. And then the others would get their lessons. And then you'd wait, wait until everybody. And then you either flew back with an instructor or you went back on the bus where everybody came out around noon. And a new bunch went out in the afternoon. And then in the afternoon, we studied um, uh, academics then. Uh, we lived in an old uh, motel along the highway up uh, uh, along the north side of the airport and uh, marched back and forth down to uh, the airfield about one block over and one block down and then uh, uh, you know three quarters of a mile to the to the uh, Ryan school so we trained there for uh, I don't know three three months something like that I don't remember the number of hours we got, but uh, it was probably around, well, less than a hundred, somewhere between 60 and <laughs> 60 and a hundred. And then time to move on and go to basic flying school. Well, I didn't, uh, uh, I'm thinking, hey, travel again. We'll go to Florida or Texas, someplace other than California. Where do you think my second station was? It was Bakersfield, California, 200 miles closer to home. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there we flew the uh, consolidated bolt key. BT-13, a, a much, uh, oh, back to the other airplane, you noticed it was uh, open cockpit and uh, not a uh, fixed gear and a very simple airplane. The BT-13 was uh, certainly one step ahead, much more powerful engine. Now we had a radio, we didn't even have a radio in the, uh, and the primary trainer. And uh, as you can see, we had uh, a uh, canopy, so we were enclosed. And the back seat was fixed up so you, you could uh, pull a hood over, your, over yourself and look at the instrument panel and learn how to fly instrument weather, weather flying. But a still fixed gear, a two position prop, whereas we had a fixed pitch on the uh, primary trainer and flaps and uh, night, night, night lights. So it was equipped. We started doing night flying, formation flying, instrument training, and a lot of the basic maneuvers we were repeated in. Uh, in Basic, uh, basic flying school. So three more months and uh, we go, we head for um, advanced flying school. This is where we're gonna get our wings and, and our commission as a second lieutenant. <clears throat> and again, a chance to travel to uh, Texas or Florida again, but no, <laughs> I ended up it was uh, Arizona, at least we got out of the state. And uh, right next door, and right near Phoenix. And uh, there we flew the AT-6, North American Advanced Trainer. Again, a radio and, uh, and the uh, canopy was very similar to the, oops. Uh, 
uh, has a canopy radio and a hood in the back, retractable landing gear, and a constant speed prop. And about, uh, gosh, what the heck was the, four, 450 horsepower, I think. It was a real airplane. Uh, there I felt like I was really flying. And uh, <clears throat> it was a tail dragger. And I think it was a very good trainer because you really had to pay attention uh, to you know, landing the T6. You did not want to let it swerve, swerve in any direction at all. It was very easy to ground loop if you got lost control of it. So now the, uh, uh, oh, and I got to bring up a point here. Uh, we're trying to um, train 225 or 250,000 pilots and we we're trying to do it as fast as we could and don't let safety get in the way of progress. It's a sad state, a sad uh, statistic. We actually killed more people in training than we did in combat. And uh, so, uh, and also we needed, uh, we needed pilots in every capacity, instructors, bomber pilots, uh, cargo pilots, fighter pilots. So if you want to be a fighter pilot and you could convince your instructors that you'd be a good fighter pilot, your chances were pretty good of getting your choice of, of assignments. So now I always wanted to fly, but then the other thing was I thought, oh, I always wanted to be a fighter pilot. Uh, no, don't know exactly where that happened, but uh, I guess it was watching the Battle of Britain uh, newsreels and reading up on these kind of things, airplanes, different airplanes and what they did. And then I also thought if it was just me in that airplane, I'd be responsible for everything. I wouldn't have to depend on a 10-man crew to do things. I would be the pilot, the radio man, the gunner, the navigator, uh, the works, anything you can think of. And besides, I thought the fighters looked a little cooler than the bombers. So I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And I was able to do that September 29th. Uh, 1942, we got, uh, got our wings and uh, headed off for the first, first assignment as, as, a, as an army pilot. And of course there would be more training, uh, we knew that, but we didn't know where we would gonna go. And again, to the chance to travel, I keep doing that thing. Uh, a chance to travel. Where do I go? I go to the San Francisco Bay Area to the 357th Fighter Group, no, a, a training group, 329th training group. And we're going to fly the P 39 in, in uh, well, several months of, uh, of training. The idea was this, this was a replacement pilot training group. Uh, and uh, we didn't even stay at, we went, we were assigned to Hamilton Field, but our duty was at Oakland Municipal Airport. So I still hadn't really been on a base very long, very, very often. And uh, there we would uh, get checked out in the P-39 and uh, we would, uh, then go off to, to join some fighter group somewhere in the world and uh, go in the combat zones. So uh, when uh, 
when my three months were up, they uh, came around, they said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, you, 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 uh, Bud Anderson again. Uh, you're not going to, to a combat unit yet. Uh, you're going to the brand new 357th fighter group that's uh, being activated as a combat group. You're going to train here in the United States and go overseas as a fighter group. If you ever, if that was ever a good deal, it sure was for me. The biggest thing it gave me was more flying. Uh, extra training that I hadn't gotten. Not, not that I hadn't gotten, but more of it. And the more flying you do and the more training you do in bombing, gunnery, and track, uh, uh, aerial gunnery, and skip bombing, dive bombing, stuff like that, the more uh, the better pilot you are, generally speaking. And uh, so going in at the bottom or at the start of a um, brand new fighter group is also real good for promotion. Here I am, uh, uh, second. Well, I think I was a first lieutenant by then. Uh, into a brand new fighter group, I'll certainly be a flight leader because we'll be taking new guys and and training them. Uh, and be responsible for that training. Uh, that tells you how we were prepared for World War II. Uh, we went to uh, uh, Casper, uh, we went to Tonopah, Nevada. For, uh, uh, and got our airplanes, and our crew chiefs, and uh, and the mechanics, uh, all the support personnel. And then we started training our second lieutenants right out of flying school. Checked them out in the airplane. And uh, then we started doing tactics. And you know the same kind of training I went through, we have to help them through it. Uh, I want to say a few words about the uh, P-39. It was a, uh, it was a, you know, you, there's a saying if a pipe, if a plane, airplane looked good, it flew good. Not necessarily. <laughs> this is a good looking airplane, I think. And it had a cannon that fired, it fired through the, the barrel, went through the propeller. And then the cannon system was here up in this nose. And uh, there was a crankshaft, a drive shaft that ran through the floor of the uh, floor of the air of the P-39. And then back here and hooked up with the engine. Uh, it had automobile type doors, you can see them here actually had a roll-up window, just, just like in a car. And it was a cozy uh, cockpit. Uh, it rattled around a little bit until you got the engine started, I guess, because of all this uh, linkage. Uh, uh, and the instrument panel was shaking around. And then when, as soon as it ran out, get run the smooth and it was pretty good. Some people said that, that the uh, Air Cobra P-39 would tumble in flight. I never tumbled one, but I've seen guys fall out of a, a rat race uh, over the field, you know, and get into some kind of maneuver and the airplane departed. And then I'm sure that they thought they did it did some wild gyrations. And the pilot probably thought he tumbled, I'm sure. But I, uh, I, I don't know if you flew the airplane, it, I thought it was a pretty good airplane until I flew something else. 
And uh, so we train around there, moved uh, to, uh, my gosh, moved to Santa Rosa for a short time, moved to Oroville, California for a short time. And my gosh, that's, uh, that was about an hour or so from home. And I could take a flight of four and hold it down, be over the ranch in about uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. And we used to do that once in a while. The folks, if I didn't come by and say hello, they wondered what was wrong. <laughs> we don't do those things anymore. Okay, so we finally moved to somewhere in Wyoming for our final uh, training with bombers and stuff like that. And then uh, we got on a troop train and headed for New York. And I can't remember where we learned that we're, oh, we wondered where we'd go because flying the P-39s and uh, so uh, the, uh, they were in the South Pacific and North Africa. So we fully expected to go there, but when the time came, somewhere between uh, Wyoming and England, I guess, uh, we got the word, we're not gonna go fly P-39s in North Africa. We're gonna get on uh, Queen, Queen uh, Elizabeth, the sister ship to the Queen Mary and go to England, and then we're going to be join the, uh, well, we're going to join the Ninth Air Force in P-51s. We hadn't even seen a P-51, let alone. There's a P-51B model. And this, this, uh, this was my airplane. Uh, this was obviously taken right after the invasion. Uh, it had a, did not have a B model canopy. It had what they called a Malcolm hood. It was a Br British uh, design and, and uh, manufactured. And it replaced the old, uh, let's see if I can go back one. That, no, I don't know whether that, no. Uh, uh, the the, uh, B, the B, Bs and Cs had, uh, had a, uh, a, a slats across here and a canopy that opened up uh, over the top. And wherever you wanted to look, there was a slat. It was a kind of lousy visibility out of it. But when you put this thing on, it solved everything. You could lean out of your engine on this side and count your engine stacks. And you could almost lean back and look over, the, over that way. No, that's pretty good. You could easily look behind you. And uh, so that, that was the... Uh, airplane we trained in in, uh, uh, in England, getting, uh, uh, getting time and the thing was difficult. We sent a pilot up to the port and then he'd find a crew chief and get, the, get them to start it for you. And the guy would fly at home and then check out the next guy. There didn't. Uh, the uh, pilot handbook didn't even come with the airplane. And so okay, it was a do-it-yourself training program. <laughs> but once we flew that P-51, we knew we were getting a gem. It was so much better than the uh, P-39. You know, like I say, we didn't even have anything to compare it to. And now we knew we had an airplane and uh, a real airplane. Uh, I was very lucky. Uh, when I got there, the, the uh, group commander said, Bud, you're gonna go over to uh, 
such and such an airfield and go through the Royal Air Force Central uh, Fighter Gunnery Instructor School. And you take a P-51 over there and uh, and get get you know fly it during the course instead of the pit Spitfires. So that gave me I got thirty five hours in the in the P fifty one before combat. Another great break for Bud Anderson. So let's see what we got here. Oh, that's a good day in England. That's a nice day. And we flew many, many days like that, and some worse. Hey, we pretty pictures here. Uh, uh, the B6 stands for uh, the R squadron, the 363rd squadron. The B6 in there. Then you got a bar, and then you got an alphabet letter. That was the airplanes one, two, three, four, five, six, you know. The, however many airplanes we had. Uh, and the uh, noses when we first got over there were uh, all white. And obviously this was just before the invasion or around there, no, after the invasion. And these are D models, not, not all these. Oh yeah, now we got to talk about the crew chiefs and things. I picked up the crew chief at uh, at uh, uh, at Tonopah when we were flying P thirty nines, and I just liked the way he handled it, the way he talked, and he was from uh, he was had a Finnish background and. He, came from New York and I think he was an automobile mechanic uh, before he got in the service. But uh, he really impressed me on in the old P-39s. He came up and said, uh, hey, what can I do to make this airplane better? Well, there was a gun sight with a combining glass right in front of the, uh, right in the center of the, of the armor plated windshield and it would get dust in there and they couldn't keep it clean. It was, it was a very tiny space there. So I told them about that. I thought it would take, you know, I'd have to take the sight down and then recalibrate the guns and, you know, it'd be work intensive. I came back in the morning and flew again and Holy smokes, this thing was crystal clear. And I said, Otto, how'd you do that? He says, oh, I found a turkey feather and I was able to get it in there and work at it and work at it and get it, get it crystal clear. <laughs> he was ingenious. Uh, when we got the Mustangs, um, he changed the spark plugs every time, every flight, every combat mission. And, uh, he'd go to the supply and find another fin and said, hey, there's reconditioned plugs and there's uh, brand new plugs. You save the brand new plugs for, for him, for Bud Anderson, for the old crow, my P-51. Uh, this obviously was a posed picture, uh, but this is the way we actually flew. Uh, this, it was very cold. God, the P-51 had a, had, a, had a heater, or it said heater on it, a little thing over your right foot that had the words heater on it, but boy, it didn't put out much heat. Uh, when we got these boots, that kind of solved that problem. Uh, the the, the uh, bomber boots. But I flew with a uniform pants, uniform shirt, winter flying suit, actually a leather, a, a silk scarf. And that was very important. Uh, not for looks, but the winter flying suit was wool and it would scratch your neck. It, was very, it could be very uncomfortable. 
And you notice here, uh, my goggles, these are Royal Air Force type goggles. Uh, when we first got over there, we, we uh, requisitioned them from the Brits. They were so much better than our helmets uh, at, the at that time that almost all of us, all, all of us got war of these and uh, never took them off even after we got our good ones. And this is Leon Zimmerman, my, uh, my armor. Uh, Otto was so good, he didn't take, uh, didn't take an assistant crew chief. He made him work. <laughs> And he was very, very willing to do it. These guys were so, so crazy. With a great story I want to tell you about the crew chiefs was uh, during my second tour, I picked out a brand new D and uh, had it in uh, all camo like this. I'm going to tell you about these white walls after a while. Uh, and uh, we were we weren't not we weren't paying to, this was after the invasion and we started having silver airplanes all camo half and half uh, it was a circus uh, so um, I started uh, in, my, in my second tour in, in November or December somewhere in there maybe even October, the first snow hit, first big snow hit Germany. And uh, I was flying with a flight of four. No, I, and, and then we got over Germany over and it was just widespread snow. I mean, just all over. And I noticed a, a flight of four below me, two of them were camouflaged and two of them were silver. Well, guess which one stood out? The camouflage ones, the, the like this, they were like, a, you know, in a punch bowl. And the silver ones were fairly camouflaged. So when I got back from this mission, I, uh, Otto was now um, a line chief. And he handpicked a new crew chief for me and uh, Schunemann. And, and, but he came to my airplane and saw me off in the morning. And he was there at night when I came back. And, and he wanted to know what's going on. He wants to participate in the old, you know, keep the old crew going. But he had three airplanes, six airplanes to look over look after. So they're there and I'm telling them about it and all that, what happened, nothing. Uh, and uh, then I told them about the, uh, the uh, camouflage and the snow. And, and, uh, and I said, hey, uh, Whenever this thing's laid up for heavy maintenance, how about depainting it, put it in the silver paint scheme? And I knew I was going to finish in the in this in the winter, so they wouldn't have to repaint it. And uh, I knew this would take it what day or two. I don't know. I went back into operations. I was the operations officer, and I said, "I might think I'll fly tomorrow." Put my name on the board, went home, didn't think about it. Next morning after breakfast to go uh, uh, get the big briefing, come back to the squadron, and then do your flight briefings, uh, and then get your, get your uh, flight gear and go to your airplane. Well, this revetment here, uh, this wall, because operations is that just that way about 75 yards. So I don't know pretty much, we'd, I'd walk out to my airplane many times. So I walk up, God darn it. 
I walk up over the uh, uh, revetment, standing on top of the revetment, and I look down, and there's my Mustang in gleaming aluminum. And these uh, three guys were there, and they would all kind of stand at attention. <laughs> And I was shocked. I said, good God, how'd they do that? Well, they'd started to work the minute I disappeared over the revetment and had it ready to go. And uh, I was, God, I looked at them, their hands were raw. They'd use 145 grade fuel to scrub it off and uh, scrape it and get it going and then repaint the damn thing. Uh, I felt a little bit like a jerk, you know. But I did tell them uh, when it was laid for heavy maintenance. But what I'm telling you is this is just an example of what they would do. These guys weren't doing the dying and uh, they wanted to make a con contribution to, you know, to, to the success and success of the war. And I just can't say enough about the support we got uh, during World War II. That's everything. I mean, uh, I don't remember being short anything. Food, uh, uh, cigarettes, whiskey. <laughs> we. Uh, we had we had everything parts. And, uh, okay, here's some more pretty pictures. Uh, you all know what uh, contrails look like, and uh, in, over Europe in the winter, uh, they were really quite persistent. Uh, several times when they were persistent, it was dream dramatic. Can you imagine what a thousand bombers and another eight, nine hundred fighters looked like in a stream going over Germany? I think from the ground, they had to be kind of intimidating. I gave this talk down at Fresno at Castle Air, Air, Air Museum down there once. And after I talked, a little gray haired old German lady came up to me and, and uh, she had a big, thick accent. She said, we weren't worried about those white things up there. We were worried about those, the, the, the stuff that we were shooting in the air. When it explodes, it has, the pieces have to come down. I never thought of that. <laughs> and this, this, is a, this is one of the best flak pictures I could find. Uh, flak over there was incredible, and these bomber pilots had to, uh, they had to go through that and fly straight and level for, I can't, I don't know how long it is to, to make an accurate bomb run with the Norton bomb site. And that was the whole part of doing daylight bombing was accuracy. The Brits uh, tried it. They said it won't work. You're going to take too many losses. You got to go bomb at night and just area bomb. Well, we're Americans. We did it our way, and uh, and we started taking terrible losses. Uh, November of uh, forty-three, no forty-four. They had a stand down, the 8th Air Force. And they said, well, we've got to have fighter escort now. Well, they had 38s and 47s over there that had been escorting, but they couldn't go far enough. So uh, they said, well, we think that uh, I got to move this thing along. Uh, We got, we got, we we need a long-range uh, fighter, 
and right field had the solution. It was the P75. It was a uh, it, it was a terrible airplane. Uh, it had this brand new big uh, Allison engine in it. It was made by General Motors. They stuffed enough scaffs in it so it would fly as far as a B-17. And finally, a fighter pilot from Wright Field got to fly it. And he says, came home, told his boss, he says, hey, uh, this thing can't even defend itself. We've got to get something else going. And he knew what North American was doing. They were putting extra gas tank in and attaching external tanks. And uh, but Wrightfield didn't want to have anything to do with the P-51. Matter of fact, there's evidence that people tried to prevent it from getting into production. Uh, but they were but they they finally did. Their perseverance, uh, the fighter pilots at Wright Field got it changed and. Uh, then he got them, got it started, got them headed towards the Mustang. Well, once they got built, started building them, they couldn't build enough of them. The Pioneer Mustang group was already in Europe, it was assigned to the Ninth Air Force for tactical air support. And so were we. So they had loaned the uh, 354th group to uh, the Pioneer group to the Eighth Air Force. And they were so wildly successful that the Eighth Air Force demanded that they get the uh, get the uh, uh, P-51s. Uh, it, the, the Mustang was ideal for the European theater. It's just what they want. Uh, it did have enough gas to go where the B-17s wanted to go. Uh, and it had the endurance. Uh, endurance and range kind of go together, but uh, sometimes you need endurance, sometimes you need range. Uh, let's see what's next here. More pretty pictures. Okay, we're looking at the top guns of the 357th Fighter Group. Left, your left to right, Peterson, Carson, the top gun. Johnny England, England Air Force Base. Here's the pilot that the base was named after. And a young Bud Anderson on the far right. Uh, all around 15 to 18 victories. All right, I'm going to show you a, a video now. And uh, a little bit about tactics first. Let me get over here so I don't. Uh, this is, I got to get this back. I'll tell you about this later. We're going to watch the video now. May 27, 1944. This is what Bud Anderson's four P 51 Mustangs escort an American bombing mission. Now, Relive the dogfight as he faces a flight of deadly German MP109s. Anderson has one advantage that the fighters of World War I lacked. Improvements in electronics now allow planes to carry a radio. We hear on the radio that up front, ahead of us, they were being attacked. My wingman's on the inside. He calls out, hey, we got four bogeys, unidentified airplanes attacking us, coming down on us from five o'clock high. We're very vulnerable. The opening moves of a dogfight are critical. Anderson can go left, right, straight, climb, or dive. If Pud turns left, he's in the angle of attack. If he goes straight, the Messerschmitt, its dive giving it superior speed, will overtake him. His only hope is to break right. The German is going too fast to make the sharp turn. So we turn like this very hard. Bud's flight does a half circle, then goes head on toward the Germans. The two groups pass each other. 
The Germans turn left, so do the Mustangs. It's a lethal game of hunter and hunter as each side tries to get on the other's vulnerable six o'clock. Now we got four Emmy 109. Four Mustangs coming around. They want to fight. So they're coming around, and we're coming around now in a big left circle. This, this goes about two times. Each time they come around, I'm a little closer to getting in trail with them. So we've turned their advantage now to our advantage. Bud is here. The Germans are here. The Mustang's tighter turn gives them an inside track. The smaller turning radius allows the Mustangs to close in. Anderson's plan, use this advantage to get on the ME-109's tail. Line up, fire. You do all this stuff by instinct. You don't have it all figured out. You just you do it instinctively. The Mustang's 450 caliber machine guns carry nearly 1,300 rounds, but that's just 20 seconds of ammo. Anderson needs to make every shot count. We're all young, indestructible, I hope. <laughs> I knew it was a lie, but uh, you have to think that way. The Germans spot the Mustangs closing the range and make a run for them. Top speed of 441 miles per hour. The Mustang is over 50 miles per hour faster than the ME 109. One German breaks away from the pack and climbs. I'm looking at this guy and I don't want to get too far up or he can drop down on me. Anderson sends two of his Mustangs, led by Eddie Simpson, after him. Bud and his wingman, John Scarpa, stay after the other three ME-109s. Bud uses the Mustang's superior speed and gets within 300 yards of the Messerschmitt. When you shoot somebody down, the best way to do it is to get right here, what we call six o'clock. That's what I did with this guy. The wounded 109 does something that amazes Anderson. He keeps flying upside down. And I thought, what the heck's he doing? You know, uh, if he's going to run away, he just would roll over and pull away. I'm sitting there right side up very comfortably and pump some more shells into him. It was Anderson's sixth kill of the war. It's now two against two. Bud can tell the Germans are nervous. Their planes twitch as the pilots strain, pulling on the stick as they look over their shoulders. One German dives to escape. The other climbs and turns. He still wants to fight, clearly one experienced dogfighter. When you saw a German airplane, you treated him like a red baron. I mean, you used every advantage you had over him and without the knowledge of knowing who was in that airplane. Bud tries to follow the ME-109. The German turns a hard left. Bud realizes he's going too fast to make the turn. He passes the German and climbs, trying to gain the advantage. Bud is now above the German. If the German continues to turn, Bud can drop on him. If he dies, Anderson can give chase. But the ME-109 skillfully reverses his turn, pulls a hard right, and gets behind the Mustangs. Bud is in front. His wingman, John Scara, is right behind. It's now Scara who has the German on his tail. Anderson tells Scar to die, hoping the German will follow. No, drop in behind me. Maybe we can get him that way. So John did that. Sure enough, boy, they went right after him. At over 400 miles per hour, Bud dives after the ME 109 that's still on Scar's tail. He sees that right away. Come on, straightens out. 
pulls away. Then he comes around on this hard turn again. The German has pulled the same maneuver. Left turn, hard right. Using Volker's fifth rule, he's now on Bud's tail. I've got the problem. So I pull the airplane up as deep as I want to. Full power. Got everything just going as I can. I know that I've got a little more energy than it is, but uh, I'm thinking about plan B. In Bud's head, he knows that energy or air speed is life. Anderson's in trouble. It's the only time in his Air Force career that an enemy fighter is behind him, almost making a perfect attack. Still be killed. There's big odds that she might not make it. Uh, he might be killed in this thing. And you wonder inside, uh, how am I going to perform personally? Well, am I going to run or am I going to fight? Uh, you don't know. I mean, you can train, but the actual thing is is real. It's real. One hit from the German's 30 millimeter cap could shred his Mustang. Life or death is seconds away. You know, I can see that hole in the drop where the big cannon is. And I'm in big trouble if he can get that gun pointed right at me. And I look back there and uh, man, that thing looked like an elephant gun to me. I'm pulling up. We're both losing airspeed at, at a pretty significant rate. And pretty soon one of us is going to stall first. And whoever does that is going to be in big trouble. When a plane flies straight up, it fights gravity, loses speed, and eventually stalls and drops. If the German stalls first, Bud will dive on his tail. But if Anderson stalls first, he will slip down below the ME 109 and will be blown out of the sky. Both planes soar upward at the edge of their performance. The pilot's adrenaline pumps as they climb in their lives. He has to lead me. He's, he's actually below me. I see him pulling. So I'm pulling. We're both pulling. With the throttle full forward, Bud has maxed his P-51 to the limit. Then, Anderson sees what he's been praying for. I see the airplane shudder. We start to lose control. The German runs out of airspeed and lift shudders, stalls, and plummets. Two seconds late, Anderson's more powerful Mustang shudders, but doesn't stall. He dives down after the German. Anderson has gone from prey to predator. The ME-109 regains control, breaks hard to his left. Anderson decides to go for the kill, but it requires a tricky, dangerous move. The German is here. Anderson is here behind him. The German continues his sharp left turn. Bud tries to follow. If he doesn't make the turn, he'll be in front of the German. Out of speed, a sitting duck. Bud bets his life that his Mustang will make the turn. It does. Anderson is now directly behind the ME 109. Now it's the German who climbs trying to escape. Anderson knows the Messerschmitt will stall before he does and gets on the German six. I start firing right in here and I saw some tracers go across the right wing a little bit. I pushed a little bit of left rudder and then pow. Hit him right in the middle, right in the wing route all around the cockpit and engine area. Tremendous white vapor came out initially. The German is hit, but his plane is still intact. And then he gets suspended in the air. So close I can see the wheel well and the rivets and the grease and everything. He just rolls over and goes down. I followed him down through 20,000 feet. I was going faster than I ever been in my life. He was going too fast. I pulled the throttle back. Well, he was smoking out and just black smoke pouring out. Must have been a mile long. It's just going straight down. I see his shadow. Maybe in his shadow there. It 
was a triumphant day for Anderson and the three other Mustangs. Attacked by four enemy aircraft, they broke the attack, then turned the tables, destroying three of the enemy. There we go. Hey, I've got one uh, one story I need to tell uh, before we go into Q and A. Uh, when the when the bombers found out that they they uh, needed long range escort and they got the P fifty one, we were the first. P-51 unit to go to the 8th Air Force, another uh, good break for Bud Anderson. And uh, so when we started flying, the 8th Air Force headquarters was run by bomber pilots, so they told us what to do. And they wanted us to fly close to them. They wanted to see us. They wanted us around them. It wasn't the best way to do it, but they said, you drive the enemy away and then break it off and come back. And we actually had an altitude limit of 18,000 feet. And if we hadn't shot them down, we had to come back up. General Doolittle took over the uh, Eighth Air Force as a thing to prod, uh, prod them into uh, doing what they're supposed to do. And that was uh, defeat the Luftwaffe and allow the invasion that was scheduled for June of 44, 40, yeah, 44. And they weren't doing a very good job of it. So they fired everybody, well, the, the leaders at least, and. Uh, put Doolittle in there. He was a different kind of guy. You got nobody, everybody knows who he was and what he did on the Tokyo raid. And so he took over and he had orders. You blow the Luftwaffe out of the sky by such and such a date or you're fired too. And uh, so he gave it a lot of thought and he had a different background. You know, he'd flown fighters and new fighter pilots and knew they were kind of aggressive, you know. So he said, uh, well, he went down to visit the uh, eighth, or eighth Fighter Command headquarters first time. He said they walked in, there was a sign over the door where he walked in, he says, said something like, the mission of the 8th Fighter Command is to bring the bombers home safely, something like that. And he said, who put that up there? And General Kepner said, I don't know, it was here when I got here. He says, well, tear it down. The mission of the 8th Fighter Command is to destroy the Luftwaffe, however you can do it. And he took away the uh, 18,000 foot limit and he actually ordered us to attack the German fighter pilots. And the spring of uh, 1944, I think our uh, uh, historians generally agree really, that's when we broke the back of the Luftwaffe. And we did not do it by bombing factories and airfields and airplanes on the ground and all that. We did it by killing their experienced pilots. They ran out of pilots. They had airplanes, nobody to fly them. They hadn't set up a training program. They thought they could just win the whole war around Europe and that would be a big mistake. But uh, that was one of the points I want to bring out. Uh, General Doolittle, one of my personal heroes, uh, his, his decisions and the Mustang had a significant impact on the European theater. It allowed the invasion of Europe and uh, 
the eventual downfall of Germany. Took everything, but I'm telling you, it was it was a significant thing what he did. Okay, I'm ready for the Q and A. Well, if there's anybody left, I think we talked too long. <laughs> no, no, no. That was that was one of the most concise uh, talks I think I've heard from a veteran. I mean, you you laid that out brilliantly, but um, so thank you. I mean, not only did we hear your personal memories, but it was a great history lesson. So, so thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions. If, if you were addressing us in person, we'd be giving you a standing ovation right now. So I'll give you a sitting ovation, but I think the rest of us uh, who are watching uh, would, would do the same. Um, the first question ties in beautifully with your last statement about uh, what Doolittle uh, change the emphasis to, to, sh to shoot down the experienced flyers instead of bombing factories and so forth. Did you notice uh, a decline in the ability uh, of the German pilots as the war progressed and, and that strategy started to work that you were getting rid of the experienced ones? Did you see a, after a difference the, in the quality of the pilots? After the invasion uh, on my second tour, uh, Yes. Yes, we did. I had to think about it a lot. And uh, when I thought about it, the engagements I had afterwards, these guys were uh, nothing, you know, they were just just uh, targets compared to uh, dog, the dogfight I had in May. Those guys were aggressive. Yes, to your question. Okay, uh, another question. Um, were you briefed very much on the um, on the strengths and weaknesses of the type airplanes that you were going against? I mean, did you know anything about certain pilots would be flying and you know their success record, or what kind of intelligence did you have prior to your uh, your, your missions? <laughs> like none. <laughs> uh, Eventually, we learned that the uh, 109 was a formidable, formidable enemy if they were fighting, if we were fighting on their grounds, you know, uh, down low. I didn't know that. I thought I could beat him at any altitude. But uh, I learned that a, a 109 could give a Mustang a hard time down low. Uh, ME-109, it was an improved uh, fighter, but I think uh, the only, the, the ones we were running with were junior pilots. Uh, I gotta say that uh, the quality of the pilot that you're flying against uh, helps. The airplane doesn't do it all. Um, how would you describe the power of the, the 50 caliber machine guns on the P-51? I mean, and how? Uh, the 50 calibers were a good compromise. Uh, you see all the big guns on the, on the uh, German airplanes because they were going after the bombers. And so they put cannons on uh, theirs. They had machine guns too in some of the airplanes, but uh, a lot of them had cannons and uh, those of course would, would take a bomber down but they just <laughs> you got hits on a fighter it was, it was bad news um i have a question there's a good question here because i was i'm glad uh, this question touched upon it your post world war ii experience you were a test pilot for a lot of experimental aircraft can you talk a little bit about that I have a whole talk for that. Okay. We'll have to bring you back. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on how long you want to hang around. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you give us a teaser for your next talk? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I've had two mostly unusual programs you could think of. Um, but the routine... Uh, test pilot stuff. Uh, I went to Wright Field 
and flew in the fighter section, eventually in chief of the fighter section. Uh, we were testing with the early jets. Uh, uh, not they weren't the ones supersonic ones yet. It was uh, like F eighty fours and F eighties and F ninety fours and uh, stuff like that. Early jets, T thirty threes, F eighty was the first one I flew, and uh, and some advanced, supposedly advanced the propeller airplanes like the F-82, the twin Mustang. It was really, uh, <laughs> it really couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, see then, while I was there, of course, I got to fly in bombers and, and uh, cargo airplane. They'd need, a, they'd need a crew member or we'd bump bum that out of them to you know get our experience in different kinds of airplanes. A test pilot is really valuable if they've flown a lot of airplanes, a lot of different airplanes, they have something to compare it with. And then uh, I went off to Korea, I guess it was, and came back to uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, I was the head of the uh, flight test operations. All the, fighter, all the uh, test pilots worked for me. And there I got to fly, out, really fly a bunch of different airplanes. I got to fly all the Century Series. And, and uh, some of them were just one flight, but uh, you, you gain that experience and you know what they're talking about. Uh, we had, uh, then we had this uh, the Century Series. Uh, we were testing. And uh, I flew fighters mostly, but uh, I would fly in the, in the bomber programs uh, as a crew member and cargo and even flew in the utility unit. I flew a U-2 once. <laughs> I didn't take it up to a tremendous altitude, but uh, just flew it and made one landing and that's enough to to uh, let you know, you just gotta pay attention. I've got, a lot of, I've got a lot of questions here. I'm, I'm gonna have to pick one because we're getting kind of late here. Um, do you have a favorite, uh, uh, is there a particular aircraft that you would describe as your favorite, either yeah. during the war or after the war? I don't have a, a single airplane. I have several in my, the P-51, of course, is a favorite for obvious reasons. It got me through the war, blah, blah, blah. And it's good looking, sounds good, and it flies good and did a hell of a job. Then uh, the F-86, the first uh, swept wing jet fighter, and it could actually go supersonic in a full power dive going straight down but just barely and uh, it was a great airplane it was so honest it never surprised you as a beautiful airplane and uh, all those good things so it became a uh, so then we get into the uh, supersonic jets and things like that and i like to fly the f-104 it, it had it, it had a <laughs> hardly had a wing. It was very short, very sharp wing, and it was really powerful and really it was a rocket ship. You could climb, climb, take off, climb in a burner, roll over, then roll out, accelerate out to Mach two and a half. You go to Mach two pretty easy. But on the right day or the right temperature and the uh, right engine, proper engine, 
I've, I've seen Mach two and a half on them. You could fly them out there according to temperature and you had a big temperature gauge and you keep it in the green. And, and uh, you know, if you were starting to accelerate out, okay, you, know, you knew you could go faster, but the temperatures are reaching that you, you come out of burner and go on home, forget about it. But uh, then the newest airplanes that you get to fly are pretty darn good. Uh, no, they're beautiful. <laughs> uh, they are flown through a computer, so you can shape their um, the forces on the sticks, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you, you can um, tailor make it to what you want, uh, and so. Actually, after I got after I retired, the Air Force wanted me to do something, and they said we'll give you an F-15 ride and an F-16 ride if you'll do it. Uh, and so I got a uh, front seat ride in a two-place F-15 Eagle, and I tell you what, that was something else, and I just just. Uh, marvel at how that airplane flew and so it became a favorite you know you have all the bells and whistles that uh, that work on the airplane and uh, i got one flight in it in the from the front seat and then a back seat e, e model when i went to alaska to talk to a f-15 uh, wing there those are my favorites. Well, hopefully your uh, your life and career have inspired other people to build model planes and have pictures in their bedrooms so that they can want to be a flyer <laughs> like you. Um, but it sounds like you have a lot more good stories to tell. Maybe we can persuade you to, <laughs> to come back. Um, I know Chris Huffman is with us. So Chris, uh, you'll have to follow up and get Bud back to talk about his post-World War II experience because I'd like to hear about your relationship with Chuck Yeager and uh, lots of other stuff. Well, Chuck Yeager was actually on my World War II squadron too. So we flew combat together as well as uh, flight testing. My two projects that I would probably give you in detail so you can understand why and what and how it worked and what didn't work and stuff like that. I did a project called, uh, it had a name, I mean, but I'm 10, something 1016. And it was a uh, aircraft coupled together experiments. And, uh, and I did all the first, first, test first flying and all this until they shipped me out. And then it, uh, it ended up with a fatal crash. And, uh, but I was there too for that. Uh, it involved at first a C-47 with a little color cadet, they called it a Q-14 military airplane and it had a little probe and a, a boom and a ring out the thing. And it was beveled backwards inside the ring, the forward burst was backwards. And so there was a little ball, a ball and a probe to go back into this beveled ring. This being the beveled side, that'd be going forward. So you had to come up here and back into the, whoops, he had to come in here and back, back in, I had that back, I had that backwards. And so you back the ball and spike into the ring from the front of the airplane back, bring it back in. That's a lot more difficult than going in and punching it forward. But we had to do that to keep it simple because the, uh, 
cutting the problem prop would uh, hold it in there and throw and adding power it just blow you out so there's that project to talk to and then I did another one uh, it was a parasite fighter and you remember what a b36 was yes it was a huge 10 engine bomber and we took that as the mothership and put a trapeze uh, system recovery, launching and retrieving trapeze. And we took a standard uh, F-84 uh, standard straight wing F-84 and put a uh, probe up on the nose, uh, up in front of the uh, front of the uh, air inlet, in fact. That's how it started out. But then it ended up with a, a receiver mounted on top of the air, right in front of the windshield, really close. And that ended up being the successful way. And so I had some excitement with that. The, Airplane was unstable where it's with the first uh, uh, hookups of the nose probe. Airplane would start and you couldn't control it, even if you let go. <laughs> and uh, it was dangerous, very dangerous. You couldn't stay put, you couldn't stay hooked up for hardly anything. And so we finally got the problem solved and found out what it was. was a, loose uh, it was just the, the receiving boom was just too loose we put a, a snubber from the front of the bomb bay to the, the top of the snubber and that stiffened it up and we went on ahead and made the thing successful and then uh, we uh, put the uh, uh, rf-84 GRF-84F swept wing recce airplane and uh, then turned it over to SAC and they kept it for a little while and then they said, well, we don't need this thing anymore. Your taxpayer dollars at work. <laughs> so we got, uh, you know, satellites and uh, U-2s and SR-71. So I don't know. Good grief. I feel like I'm taking a college course from you in aircraft, sir. I mean, you really know your stuff. I'm, uh, there's a, a lot to learn. Um, yeah. but thank you for sharing some of it. And I'm going to turn this over to Bob to do the wrap up and the ceremonial gift giving. Bob, th or, uh, Bud, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and in case Bob doesn't mention it, uh, anybody wants to find out more about um, Bud's World War II experiences. We've had the book cover uh, flash up there. Please uh, get his book from a local bookstore or some other place and, and read more about it. Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, I might add that it's not readily available at a lot of bookstores. You can get it on Amazon, but uh, right here on on your slide, you've got our website uh, thing. We need. There's the best place to go get it. Good. I was going to say, Bud. <clears throat> there's the website if you would like to buy a copy of Bud's book. And as I was talking to Bud earlier today, he said he'd be more than happy to personalize the book and autograph it for you if you contact his son through the website. And there's his son's email address. Well, that's the website. Well, there's the website at top. And then please email Jim Anderson at Jim, S-W-A at Juno.com. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Bud, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, we do not pay our, our speakers. However, we do send them a highly coveted often 
duplicated, but never, uh, I can't see if I can get it in the focus here. World War II, Central Pennsylvania World War II round table coffee mug. Also <laughs> useful for drinking bourbon or spirits of your choice. And I will put this in the mail to you in the next day or two. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you Glad to add it to my collection. <laughs> I was going to say, you can add it to your collection. Uh, and then last but not least, I'm happy to announce next meet, month's meeting on Thursday, September 2nd at 7 o'clock. Our speaker will be Herschel Woody Williams. Uh, Woody Williams is a World War II Medal of Honor recipient. I understand he might be the last living World War II Medal of Honor recipient, and he will be our speaker that evening. We hope to see everyone then, and uh, thank you, and good night, and Bud, again, uh, how honored to have you, and would have welcomed you back now that you and I have figured out how to make Zoom work. <laughs> <laughs>